Okay, great. Go ahead, uh, JP. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andy, um, and thank you, Manisha. I'm excited to be here, um, seeing lots of familiar faces and some names I don't recognize. Um, for many of you, what I'm going to be talking about is going to be familiar because you helped develop it. Um, uh, for, but it's been a while, uh, so it might be a refresher, and for others, uh, it might be more or less new. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is to give you a sense uh, of how we thought about harm claim thresholds, which, as the title says, there is a way of incorporating receiver performance without using standards. Um, you, Many people know me as Pierre. I also go by JP, just in case people get confused. Um, I am going to actually do things in a slightly unusual way. Let me just quickly ask, does anybody have a you know, question so that I have a sense of what people want to know so I can tailor my presentation as I go. Not a long disquisition at this point, hopefully we'll have time at the end, but does anybody have particular questions they hope this presentation about harm claim thresholds will address? I have one if nobody else does. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, so what is a practical way to start some type of implementation of receiver yep. performance requirements. Um, if you look at the NOI, yep. there's, I believe, 180 questions, and it's, you know, asking everything under the sun, but it seems like there's got to be a practical place to start. Yep. Um, and thank you for that. I, I do actually have uh, one of, so let's, with that, are, are there any other questions? Um, JP, just one thing, and uh, as I read the NOI and I think about harm claim thresholds, I can't help but thinking that passive receivers, you know, how do they fit into the question, uh, to, to this approach of determining uh, receiver standards or interference? Passive receivers meaning ones that don't Meaning have like radio astronomy, weather yeah. satellites, uh, yeah. those kinds of receivers. Okay, right. Okay, great. So I've got those two. And let's let's call that good for now and move on um so the story that i want to tell you um goes something like this uh receivers are an issue with managing interference they're at least half the problem uh all of you know that better than i do so i'm going to take that as read uh there's been a lot of talk about receiver standards they're better than doing nothing but what i'm going to try and argue is that they're hard to do um, and I'm going to try and make the case for an alternative, harm claim thresholds or interference limits. And then to Andy's question, actually, you know, there's also some material on what the FCC can do to move things forward, but, you know, specifically what the TAC can do. So before we start uh, delving in, I just briefly want to define a couple of my terms. Um, so, you know, this is receivers, but in general, you know, I think of specifications as a way to describe how a piece of equipment operates. Uh, there's a big universe. There's a subset of that, which are standards, which are set by standard settings organizations, you know, in government, you know, things like Etsy, which are sort of semi-government or ANSI or IEEE or whatever. Then there are mandates, which are a subset of specifications, which are in rule or statute. And they can incorporate standards by reference, and the FCC does, but they could also, you know, just come up with them on their own. And so when people talk about receiver standards, um, it's sometimes amb ambiguous to me, at least, whether they mean standards or mandates or both or neither. So I just wanted to flag that and we'll get into that. My overall approach is, since we're talking about what the FCC can do, effectively, it's going to be about mandates, because even if the FCC blesses a standard, um, you know, then, you know, the, there is some government decision making involved there. Uh, the nomenclature in terms of these two phrases that we use. So this is what uh, those of you who were with, who were, uh, you know, in the spectrum receivers and working group uh, way back then will remember. This is what we defined. We said interference limit policies were the ways to describe the environment and the harm claim thresholds were the particular signals that must be exceeded before a seg, uh, system can claim interference. The reason we actually came up with those two definitions uh, was that essentially uh, both of them were floating around and uh, we didn't want to pick one. So I essentially treat those terms as more or less uh, synonymous. 
Um, Russ raised the hand. Well, you even translated my email. Yeah, just a quick question on your previous slide on the comment that the only thing the FCC could do would be mandates. It's not exactly true. Um, in the NOI, it's very clear they're looking for advice on whether to do um, push for industry standards, um, provide incentives, um, even um, what was the other thing? Um, but anyway, it doesn't have to be mandates. Oh, it could be mm. policy, um, a policy statement or something. So, yeah, I just want to be clear that the FCC has a lot of choices. The FCC does have a lot of choices. You're right, Russ. I would argue that um, the industry, you know, essentially deferring to industry is actually not going to solve the hardest problems, and which is where we need solutions. And I'll make that case later. Um, incentives will actually require government to intervene. And so I would argue that even incentives there, you're absolutely right, they're not mandates, um, but they will actually, they they are the government putting its finger on the scale uh, in, in ways that will require difficult decisions. So let's circle back to that point. Thanks for raising it. Um, and by the way, if I, I'm, I'm flipping between my slide deck and uh, Google Meet. So Andy and Manisha, if somebody has a question and I don't see them, please interrupt me. Uh, yeah, Andy Scott from NCTA has uh, his hand raised. Andy, go ahead. Thanks, JP. On, on the previous slide, um, you had a harm claim threshold definition there. Yep. Uh, can I, can I, can one also assume that um, in that definition, there could be a, a temporal element? In other words, not only must the signal be exceeded, but but potentially it could, needs to be exceeded over some percentage of, of time. Is that is that a fair assumption? Yes. Uh, the first version of this work that we did uh, actually framed it more or less as, you know, not to exceed some field strength for some percentage of places and times. Great, thank you. Uh, the example that I will talk about will be uh, just percentage of places because the example that I'll be using is a more or less static, uh, not, not that static, but static enough kind of service like cellular that doesn't change radically uh, over long periods of time. Okay, not hearing anything else for now, moving on. Uh, okay, so, um, I, here's the argument. It's, it, it's, I'm going to do it in a couple of parts. There are six points I want to make. Um, the first point uh, I want to make is that receivers, well, overall, re doing receiver standards are hard. Any standard is hard. Any spec is hard. Mandates are harder still. What makes receiver specs difficult for, uh, for, a, for a regulator to mandate is that they're a design output, not an input. And so this uh, chart will uh, be familiar to folks who worked uh, on this stuff back in 2014. And essentially it's a flow chart. You start at the top with a bunch of things that are design requirements, including the interference environment, which could be just something as a design requirement you go measure, or it could be something that the regulator specifies like a harm claim threshold. There's a whole bunch of other things like, you know, what kind of signal do you, signal characteristics do you need? Um, a lot of business decisions, you know, what kind of quality of service do I want? What are my costs? There's regulation to take into consideration, industry standards, best practices. You put that all into the pot of the system design process, stir it a lot, and then you get a whole bunch of specs out um, that describe your system as a whole. And the receivers are part of that, but also the transmitters, you know, uh, how you deploy your system and so on. So that's the first part. Uh, the second part, uh, the second point I want to make is that regulatory certification of receivers, uh, whether it's a safe harbor or a mandate, is more complicated than for transmitters. And uh, what I what I call it is the cardboard box test. So if you're doing a receiver testing, you need to verify that it's operating properly. Uh, and operating properly, you know, is in the eye of the beholder. Whereas if we're thinking about transmitters for the FCC, operating property, properly means, you know, the power doesn't exceed something, the out-of-band emission mass doesn't exceed something else. So you can put a transmitter in a cardboard box, plug it in, crank it up, and 
check from the outside of the box whether it meets FCC requirements. You can't do that for the receiver because, for example, well, you know, adjacent channel selectivity, you have to be able to reject this kind of signal strength uh, and reject acceptably means bit error rate doesn't fall below some level. So who decides the, the suitable bit error rate and where do you measure it? Well, you've got to measure it at the receiver output. Uh, so you can't look from the outside of the box. And there's also thing when you look at things like I over N degradation, often you actually have to get into the guts of the receiver to measure what's going on. Uh, you can't just look at it from the outside. You have to have the receiver API or some other way of getting in there. Just, you know, I'm sure all of you have looked at receiver standards. Here's an example. Um, this is uh, 3GPP. This is the UE, not the E node B. Um, this is the chapter seven about receiver characteristics that stretches to 68 pages. Um, and uh, this is just um, for FDD, not TDD. And, you know, the, the, the headings are what you would expect with lots of additional requirements for, you know, different modulations and different kinds of ways of operating the system. So uh, one of the questions that I would ask was, when we're saying the FCC sets a safe harbor or endorses a standard, uh, which parts of this does it not have to take a view on? Now, I want to talk a little bit about transmit receiver trade offs. And this is something that uh, you all know. I'm just going to just put this down here very quickly, just so that we have some sort of uh, common uh, understanding. So, this is a very much a toy model. So, the blue is the receiver, that's my stuff. Uh, let's say the red is what the transmitter is doing. This is non co channel, there's no leakage from one to the other. Uh, and very simplistically, I'm just going to count the blocks and I'm going to say I want a greater than zero margin to for my system to work. And you can see uh, in the, the first case uh, where, you know, we look at the status quo, I've got eight blue blocks. There are 16 red blocks, but I've got receiver filtering that throws away six. So my margin is minus two. Oh, I've got a problem. Now, I can tolerate it by fixing it higher in the stack by doing signal processing or I can use you know, time processing, I can direct my antenna, all sorts of things. A couple of other things that we can do. One is you can just increase the received signal level or if uh, uh, your desired signal level. Uh, you can do that by increasing the, the density of your transmitters. So the transmitters are closer to receivers. There are obviously some cases where you can't do that if your satellite's in geo, um, uh, you, you can't change the orbit. So you're stuck with that. Uh, another option uh, you can do is you can reduce the transmit signal level. You can say, nope, you can't transmit more than a certain value. You can see, well, I've reduced the number of red blocks to 12. Uh, and so, yep, now I've got a plus one margin or you can improve the filtering. Uh, and so I've still got 16 red blocks, but now I'm throwing away nine instead of six. Proofed filtering, I've got a plus one margin. And so those are some of the options, sort of system design options uh, that are available if you want to, you know, make your receiver system work. When people talk about receiver standards very broadly, the way I understand is they're talking about option three. They're not talking about option two or option one or any of the others. The other thing I just want to flag, uh, and that's sort of uh, in faint letters, if you might not even be able to see it in the background, this is the engineering. All of this costs money or entails money. So all these trade-offs actually are dollar trade-offs as well. So that takes me to point three. So uh, we've talked about the first two, so they're grayed out. You've got to make trade-offs between receivers and transmitters. And, you know, 3GPP, it's intra-industry. Everybody, you know, everybody has transmitters, everybody has receivers. They're all in the same allocation. Uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's doable. When you have two different industries that are very disparate, you then get tussles across service boundaries that have traditionally, and I think intrinsically going to need regulatory arbitration. And the quote I have there is from an Etsy webinar that was talking about the implementation of the radio equipment directive of 2014, which is you know, their receiver standards initiative. And essentially, one of the bottom lines was, you know, getting people to agree on receiver parameters is, is was was the real bottleneck. The next point, 
Um, if you're talking about standards, you're essentially encoding what we understand to be the best way of do thing, doing things today, what the best use is today. Well, actually, it takes time to do standards, so it's yesterday. So it's not future-proof. It's not future-oriented. Um, it doesn't really have a way of encoding what you think you're going to be doing with an adjacent band, for example. Further, we don't talk about this much. We used to talk about this a lot 10 years ago. You know, this requirement to be technology and service neutral. Well, maybe, maybe you talk about this. I don't hear it much. Um, and then there's a question for the lawyers. Uh, you know, does the FCC actually have the authority to mandate receiver standards? Uh, I don't know. So the thing I want to just end this little section on is um, the Europeans, in terms of receiver standards, are ahead of us. Um, you know, they've had the radio equipment director for eight years. They've been, uh, you know, Etsy's been beavering away. More than half a dozen of the Etsy standards have been harmonized. They've been published in the official journal. Uh, and the RSPG, uh, the Regulator Spectrum Policy Group, um, had a strategy document. Um, you can read this in detail. You can read faster than I can talk. But in paragraph 36, they say, well, you know, we've had receivers, and, uh, you know, receivers, and we understand that. Maybe we should be more explicit about the interference environment. And they maybe, you know, receiver performance environment requirements involving to a listening mask. They don't define listening mask. But to me, that sounds, it, it, look, it, it walks and quacks a bit like, you know, interference limits or harm claim thresholds. So, I think even the Europeans who've been doing receiver standards in a regulatory framework are beginning to think about alternatives. So there's a drill down that we don't have time for now. We may come back to it later. Uh, but now I want to talk about harm claim thresholds and deference limits, just a broad overview of how they work, uh, what they set out to do, uh, what the pros and cons are. Before I rush on, let me just pause and see if anybody has a burning question. Okay, not hearing any. So there's a definition uh, that you've seen. You'll hear me say it a number of times. It's an upfront statement of the interference that must be exceeded before a system that's covered by a harm claim threshold can bring a harmful interference claim. It doesn't define harmful interference. It just says, the interference must be worse than this before you can come and tell us or ask us to make an adjudication. Uh, to do this, we need to talk a little bit about statistics. Um, and since I had a partner do this in, in uh, Excel, I can't do a slide build. So focus on the red curve here first. So the red curve is a probability distribution, right? It says, well, you know, I've got a unimodal probability distribution. You know, the, the maximum is somewhere between 20 and 30, whatever the unit is, quat lose, um, and there's a bulge. How do I characterize the shape of that curve? One way to do that is by using the CCDF, a complementary cumulative distribution function. Actually, people use the CDF too. Uh, so the CDF is the, you could think of the, the cumulative distribution function as the integral under that red curve. The CCDF is one minus the integral. Um, so to just, you know, belabor the point, uh, since, you know, probably most of you learned this at school, uh, but haven't seen it for a while. Um, so the blue curve. 100% of the data are more than one unit, which is why it starts up at the top there at one. And then gradually, you can see the red curve goes up. I'm getting more and more data at more and more values. Uh, and the median is, you know, 50% of the units are more than 26. 50% of the data are more than 26. And, you know, I can take any of those points there. So, for example, the third one I've shown there is 5% of the data uh, are 45 units or more. That means that 95% of the data are less than 45 units. And it's that 95% of the data are less than such and so is the kind of approach that we need when we're talking about harm claim thresholds. Essentially to say, um, most of the time, 95% of the time, you don't have to worry about interference more than 45 units. Um, the reason, and this goes to um, the work that the TAC did, uh, that uh, Greg uh, was the lead author on, you know, the, the nine principles. 
Um, and one of the nine principles, if, and I don't have it at my fingertips, is that you know this stuff is statistical. There are distributions. There's no, there's always going to be stuff in the tail. So that's a way of getting at the stuff in the tail. So now let's turn it into a harm claim threshold. So again, I'm going to do the same curve, uh, but I'm going to say that the quantity is a field strength. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to measure it in uh, dB microvolts per meter per megahertz, and the data is uh, you know, from drive test data that we got from Europe. The point I want to make, the footnote I want to belabor here for a moment, is that I'm talking about field strength or power flux density, same thing up to a constant. Um, which is in watts per square meter power flux density is not power. And the reason why one can't really use power is power requires uh, assumptions about the antenna, right? The square meters, the bigger the effective aperture of your antenna, the more the power you're going to induce uh, at your receiver input. And so the thing that's independent of the receiver and its antenna is the field strength. That's why we talk about that here. So there's that curve that you've seen. Uh, we've got the CCDF. I can pick a point on that. Um, CCDF. Uh, JP, I think Greg had a question. You thank want to take you, Manisha. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to what you said about the field strength is not just the antenna, but it all has a lot to do with locations. How close uh -huh. are you? How close is the receiver to the transmitter? Nice. Yes, the receive. The, if if for an omni antenna. Uh, you know, I can move my antenna and that will be different too, right? But what I'm saying is if, if by, by bad luck, your receiver just happens to be sitting right next to yes. the transmitter spot. Yep. Yes. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Okay. So when I say power, I don't mean transmit power. I mean received power. So, uh, even, some people, and, I've, and actually the FCC has done this, and I think it's somewhere in the NOI, talks about, well, should we have a safe harbor of minus 15 dBm received power? To which my question is, what's your antenna? Because if, unless you tell me what your antenna gain is, telling me, what, you know, then the receiver can change their antenna gain. The transmitter has done nothing different. Uh, but, you know, the, what's going on on the receiver could be very different. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I've picked a point there. Essentially, it's uh, at the 95th percentile of the CCDF. It says that the field strength is less than 46 dB microvolts per meter per megahertz for 95% of the data. That's one point. Um, actually, you can pick multiple points uh, if you wish. Um, so you can you can say well I'm you know my harm claim threshold is going to have that point is also going to have the point at the uh, you know the 80th percentile, or you could have you know actually you could you could theoretically specify the whole CCDF right, uh, which is an infinite number of regulatory decisions. Um, actually, just just to to click back to uh, Greg's point uh, on field strength. Uh, one of the things that uh, Bob Pavlak sort of sensitized us to a sensitize me to is you know thinking about things like you know Saffir Simpson, wind speed, hurricanes, tornadoes. So you know you, the the analogy isn't perfect, but you could say that measuring field strength is like measuring wind speed. It's not measuring the building load. The load that a wind will put on a building depends on you know how wide that building is, how high that building is, which is like your antenna. But anyway, back to the home plane thresholds. You can have more than more than one point. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here is that uh, you might want to say, well, you know, we really want to make sure we we get the really high field strengths, right? Because it's like if it's more than you know 60 megahertz, that's really bad. We want to we want to say it's like it can't be more than 60. Um, the trouble is, as you get up to the tail of the curve, it becomes, you know, you have fewer and fewer data points because there are fewer and fewer places where you will get that very high field strength. So that's, so, you know, in the work that I did with collaborators in Aachen, it turned out that, you know, the 95th percentile is a reasonably good trade-off. You know, it's high enough that it actually is something that a receiver that's being protected can take some comfort in, I hope, one would hope. Uh, but also, it's not so high that you have to do an insane amount of drive testing. 
Okay, so what does a home clean threshold look like? So here um, we are plotting field strength at some percentage of places, uh, places in scare quotes because it could be places and times uh, to Andy's point earlier. Um, and you've got an affected system that needs to be protected. Um, they can deploy any receiver they like, but if the neighbor's signal is below the threshold that I'll show you, they can't make a harmful interference claim. If it is above that, they go ahead and make the claim. So here's what that threshold, here's what that curve might look like. Uh, you can see it's out of band. It's also in band. So the, the, um, the, that U shape uh, is a bit like um, uh, uh, the, uh, ex the uh, out of band emission mask for the folks on the outside. Uh, because it essentially says, you know, you, you, you can't deliver more than that amount of field strength to the guy who's affected. The dots on the end say that the harm claim threshold only spans a certain distance away from the affected system. And here's what it might look like uh, in, in, in practice. So I pick P as 95, 95th percentile. I say the field strength should be less than 50 uh, dB microvolts per meter. Um, now, somebody can go out and measure uh, and they can say, well, you know, 95% of places, uh, it's more than that. But let's say they only did 10 measurements. Uh, that's not going to be good enough. And so in order to encapsulate, you know, taking a sufficiently large number of measurements that your data are statistically significant, you also have to define the confidence level. So, for example, if you go and measure that green point uh, and that brown, you go, I mean, when you get your data, you ask your friendly statistician or, or, or stat package to calculate the, the uh, one-sided confidence interval. With that result, you can claim harmful interference. That green dot is above the blue line. So is the confidence interval. You know, you're, uh, you can make your claim. There's lots of places, lots of cases where you can't make the claim. So going from left to right, the first one, the red dot is below the blue line. So for sure, that doesn't count. The middle one, the red dot is above the blue line. So you could say putatively the red dot is uh, exceeding the threshold, but your confidence interval isn't narrow enough. And the last one on the right, it's above uh, and it's got a good confidence interval, but it's above the boundary where you can't claim harmful interference. Uh, so, Russ, I think uh, you have your hand up. Yeah, just this slide here, JP, really is pointing to transmitter problems, not receiver problems. This is about saying, you know, claiming you might have, but this again, you know, a lot of the argument I've heard is really tied to the transmitters, not the receivers. Right. And yeah, that's what concerns me. We have to keep keep in focus, at least when, you know, related to the NOI, it's about receivers. And this, and, yes. And hopefully you're going to get to some of the discussion. I mean, there's been talk of safe harbors. There's been talk yeah. of you're safe up to this limit. But I think the other thing that needs to be considered here is um, device obsolescence too over time, which was a real issue with the FAA, for instance. Right. Okay, so so you're making two great points, Russ. One is, you know, this looks like it's about transmitters, and second is, how do we think about device obsolescence? So let me speak to both of those. Um, I would argue, uh, okay, so my my prior is, and, and this is my best guess of addressing my prior. My prior is, you don't want the FCC to get into the business of blessing, let alone defining receiver standards, because there are far too many parameters. It's much more complicated than transmitters, and the FCC doesn't have the ability to do that. Similarly, even, uh, and I'll come to why standards bodies are probably not going to work either, but that's my prior. So given that, how do we incentivize people to build good receivers? In other, and, and my answer to that is we tell them what they have to cope with. The harm clay threshold is a description for the receiver designer of what the interference environment is that they have to live with. Because if the interference is less than that blue curve, they're out of luck. They're just going to have to suck it up. Now, they may well make the business decision that, you know, I'm good. My, the economics for me are that I'm going to design a receiver uh, that is cheap, 
uh, and that it actually is going to fail 10% of the time rather than 5% of the time. Uh, but that's their business decision, but they can't come to the FCC and complain about it. Yeah, I just want to address that point there because I think all of us that are in the vendor community are very incentivized to um, build good receivers and cost economic receivers. Um, obviously, if we sell tons, like I'll use Wi Fi as an example, if we sell a bunch of uh, Wi-Fi devices that are sloppy or or don't do their job properly, or don't you know have you know get rid of things in you know interference from other bands that aren't above a threshold. That's on us, and our customers won't buy our product. So I think there's a there's an existing. Yeah, you know, I think that we need to also, at least in my view, is not just make bold client wide claims, but to talk about where there are potential issues. Um, the FCC has taken action very clearly in the past on safety and security related um, devices in different bands. Um, and there's a few others that are probably going to come up here I could point to. But yeah, I think realistically, we need to be very aware on, okay, you've got, you've got things that are you know, existing receivers out there that are fantastic. No problems. Mm -hmm. and to do blanket sort of, I'll just use the word regulation or mandates, does not make sense. I and agree. I agree with you on the FCC shouldn't be doing standards, and I don't think that's their intent anyway. But I just, I want to keep this discussion on point. On and so I would, I would argue, Russ, that, you know, to, to try and keep it on point, and I, and I, I would hope, I, I, I'm simplifying. So, yes, the claims are bold. But what I would submit is, that the fact that we have this NOI at all suggests that there are plenty of cases where poor receivers built by reputable vendors are not performing the way that many people would expect them to perform. The reason that is the case, I believe, and I'm not in the vendor community and I should be educated about that, is not that the receiver designers did a bad job, yeah, Brian, I take your point. We should try and get through it. Um, let me just wrap up. And, and so we'll table the question about obsolescence as well. But the, the, the thing that I wanted to underline is the receiver designers were making trade-offs. They were combining costs. They were combining what their transmitters were. They were making a whole bunch of decisions. And they, for them and for their customers, it was good. It might not have been good for the neighbors. So let's move on to, to Brian's point um okay so there is a drill down doesn't look like we'll have time if we have time uh, i will talk more about what the fcc should do to establish and enforce harm claim thresholds let me just quickly summarize uh, the, the, the 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 bottom line here so pros and cons so the argument that i would make is that this approach the environment approach reduces uncertainty about when interference is harmful. Um, it's readily enforceable. I've tried to show you that one can define it in the way that is enforceable. And it actually says you can build your receiver any way you like, um, but if it's quotes poor, for some poor means that it can't actually live in the environment defined by the harm claim threshold, don't come to the transmitter operator with claims. The second thing that it does is uh, it delegates system design and business decisions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Russ, as you've said, um, you know, the FCC, and I agree, shouldn't be in the business of trying to make these trade-offs. Um, I would, I, I like to believe that it will in, encourage receivers to uh, improve. Um, actually, you know, it separates ends and means. I mean, when we talk about, oh, you know, oh, gee, we need receiver standards. What we're really saying is we want to get to a place where there are better receivers, more better receivers that will, so that we don't get some of the problems we now have. Lots of receivers are good, point taken. But that's the end. It's not the means. The means isn't necessarily to say build receivers this way, which I mean, and by this way, that's what I mean by good. The, the last thing is bargaining. Uh, once the, F, the FCC is going to make rules, it's going to take a view are on a situation. The, the situation is going to change. Um, 
in a in a cosian world and this is not always going to be the case you know both you know there are many cases where both parties you know aren't commercial but there are many where they are you can actually use clearer rights to do bargaining and so uh mark Bykovsky and bill sharkey did some work with interference limits and actually showed that you know they think that they do lead to better bargaining and you know it takes the fine tuning out of the fcc's hands there are drawbacks too um i you know i'm i'm not the best person to ask about the drawbacks because i'm biased first though you know it requires statistics um the nice thing if you're talking about receiver specifications uh however they are uh, brought into regulatory purview that's a that's a bench test you do in advance uh harm claim thresholds you verify them after the fact there are some downsides for transmitters uh you know at the moment usually uh if there is interference very often the transmitter will say look you know my transmit power is is within the rules the your the received power isn't uh received signal strength isn't because my transmitter is so close to you that you get blown away uh that option will go away except you know for the five percent of cases where you're allowed to exceed the home claim threshold um, another drawback is that this is not as mature a field, obviously, as receiver standards. You know, the work that I've done with my collaborators has been 2D, isotropic, and continuous cellular. Um, however, what, what uh, you know, I've come to be aware of subsequent to the work that, you know, I did a few years ago, there's a really long literature that many of you know, I'm sure Greg knows, uh, measuring RF environment uh, in the field. And there's a lot of drive test experience, um, you know, vendors to the cellular industry and in the cellular industry itself. So to uh, Andy's question about, you know, what's a, a practical way to start for the TAC? Um, I think identifying the high value band boundaries is the single most important thing you can do. Identify places, because we're not gonna do this everywhere. We're gonna have to start somewhere uh, where there are disparate services uh, on either side, that's one requirement, and or uh, the other one is to help the FCC in expectation management. If it looks like there's going to be a repurposing in the future, so let's say you're in 2000 and you're in a band, uh, you know, where currently there are only satellite services, um, and the neighbors that are satellite services make that assumption, but you know that in 10 years you're going to have a cellular surface there. Declare it now, and 10 years down downstream you may not have problems. The second thing that the TAC is very well placed to do is to essentially make an assessment. You know, I'd love to get your assessment of what the experience has been in Europe with uh, the receiver standard harmonization process under the uh, receiver equipment directive. Um, you know, I'm, I wave my hand and say, hey, you know, I, I see dozens of papers. I haven't found dozens, but I've definitely found, uh, you know, about a dozen papers that actually talk about how do you use geospatial statistics to measure the RF environment. It's a pretty mature method. Is it mature enough? Um, and then to inventory the strengths and weaknesses of all the approaches uh, that are discussed in the NOI and that are being bandied about. So in conclusion, uh, you've, I'm not going to rehearse the definition of harm claim thresholds. You can read it. Um, you know, I argue that you can specify the interference environment. You don't have to uh, talk about receiver performance, but it will incentivize better performance. Um, and as we've shown, it's simple to include in rules uh, and to measure in the field just briefly, since I'm probably not going to get into the drill down. Um, one way we've thought about getting the stuff into the rules is you will distinguish between what you put in the regulations and what you put in bulletins. So stuff like uh, the field strength, def, you know, it's like the, the field strength limit, what percentile, uh, how high you measure it, uh, what the confidence interval is, those things are not going to change over time uh, until they do change, but probably that'll be slow. You put that in 47 CFR. Then there's a whole bunch of things about, look, what is an acceptable measurement campaign? What statistical methods are acceptable for taking a ton of drive test data and reducing it to the stuff that you can actually calculate uh, a confidence interval on? Those are things that um, you would then put in uh, bulletins. Manisha, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, just finish. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Finish. Okay. I happen to be 
Okay, so there's a bunch of references um, and a whole bunch of things we can talk about. Uh, so there are some topics, um, but uh, the the uh, the one that I really didn't get time to was establishing and enforcing harm claim threshold may address some of the questions that came up earlier. But over to you. And John um, raised his hand as well. Yeah, yeah thanks. So, so uh, I had, I just... Monisha has a question, and then John, and then I think uh, Russ had another uh, point in the chat as well. Okay. So, uh, JB, thanks for that. But, but as I'm thinking about this, isn't there kind of a chicken and egg problem here in the sense that when you're when you're trying, when the FCC is trying to set rules for a new band, mm. there isn't anything deployed that you can go off and start taking measurements as to what is happening in the neighborhood, neighboring bands. Mm -hmm. and, that, mm -hmm. and then even with 5G, I mean, it's going to take at least five to you know six years before you're going to get to what those deployments will eventually look like right mm -hmm. to even understand what the potential a full potential of interference say in altimeters or something else is going to be so how do you do this in practically how do you mm -hmm. you know any thoughts yeah. on yeah yeah i do um preliminary thoughts uh you raise a very good question uh Ed Thomas, who mm -hmm. most of us probably remember, used to say there are no facts in the future. Uh, and I, I love that one. Um, so yeah, you can't go and measure systems that aren't there, but you can model them. So you would do some modeling. The second, uh, and so that's a way of actually getting a sense of, you know, what your, uh, you know, field strength distributions are, are likely to look like. The second point is I would, suggest that the FCC is in a way already doing this kind of thing. Uh, they are speculating about the future, not very quantitatively, it seems to me very often, but you know, they are taking a view. So for example, when you define, you know, an out of band uh, emission mask, you're taking a view on, you know, what's going to be acceptable to the neighbors. Uh, there is going to be a difference, for example, between uh, you know, a service that's currently, you know, satellite service and, a, you know, an allocation that's satellite service and one that's going to be terrestrial. Um, and actually going back to something that Evan Quirrell and John Williams did like 10 years ago, you know, they talked about, you know, setting the expectations so that the, the, the folks in the adjacent bands have a reasonable expectation of what interference their receivers will have to deal with. Um, and in fact, you know, when the system gets deployed, that will be a constraint on the systems that are deployed. But if you are going to manage expectations, this is one of the few ways I can see of doing that. Thanks, JP. Okay. John. Uh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, thanks, JP. John, and then uh, I'm sort of doing this in the wrong order, but after John, uh, Russ, you can uh, chime in as well. Hello. Um, should I should I think of this measurement method as a method that the FCC would use after a complaint or a method that the license holder would use or both? Because I can think of lots of ways that a license holder who would like to be able to make a complaint can skew these results, which would make this a little more challenging to define. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you, John. Um, so, uh, the the short answer is uh this is a set of measurements that the complainant the plaintiff would make and the reason why there are going to be fcc bulletins is to essentially describe what are acceptable ways uh of doing things and so actually let me just flick through uh yeah so by the way so so essentially what um, so let's say we have that kind of harm claim threshold. What the plaintiff would do is, so this is, you know, example that we worked, 10 by 10 kilometers, they'll do a drive test. They stratify so that you don't, you know, count all the times you were parked at a traffic light. Then you, we, des we decided we'll do a, a population weighting. So there are decisions to be made about, you know, uh, what kind of stratification is allowed, what kind of weighting is allowed. Uh, and then you can go out and do the harm claim threshold. Now, the thing that I wanted to jump to is this. So, for example, 
the way I've thought about this is that the harm claim threshold policy uh, goes into regulation. So those are, you know, you can read the example. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff that are aimed at not allowing somebody to put their thumb on the scale when they bring the FCC the data. The FCC would essentially said, if you want to make a complaint, this is the kind of stuff that's acceptable. Grid-based stratification, population weighting, yada, 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 yada. And so that's how I see this happening. Okay. Does that address your question? At least and it does. Begin with? Okay. Great. Thanks, Russ. Do you want to uh, uh, raise your point? Which point was that? Uh, if any organization has done an evaluation. Of oh, the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, you know, I really would like to see sort of a, a better evaluation on where, the, <clears throat> where there is harm, where there's potentially going to be harm um, before, you know, we start, you know, creating rules, regulations, threshold limits, things like that. So I think I think it's very appropriate for certain areas or bands or devices. Um, I think we need to be careful though, just making blanket rules or statements. Uh, and that's why I just like to see a, a little bit more work done on where there is a problem. Um, yeah, I, I'm very aware of what happened a month or so ago, but that was kind of a self-made problem. Yeah, if I could just respond briefly, and then then Brian, I I just see his his hand came up. Um, you know, it, it seems to me, you know, there are there are receiver issues. Um, I doubt whether anybody's done the inventory. That would be wonderful to do. That's a great thing for the FCC uh, for the TAC to do. Um, just to underline that, in the same way that you know, receiver standards are specific to a particular service and allocation. Harm claim thresholds would not be as specific. They will be technology neutral, uh, largely, uh, but they are going to be allocation by allocation. They, the, the, it's not going to be one size fits all. One of the other things that the TAC could do is actually to say, where are some uh, useful places where we can pilot this? So I, you know, not just to identify band boundaries where this kind of stuff would be valuable, but a waiver or, or, or a location thing uh, that uh, would help. Sorry, I just read Russ's comment. Uh, and Russ, to your question, it's the <laughs> the harm claim threshold. It it is it's it's both. It's so the, Russ's question is: Is the harm claim threshold a transformer the problem? It's a way of dis it's a way of providing a system constraint. It's a problem for the transmitter, insofar as the transmitter has to make sure that, given the transmit powers and their deployments, they don't exceed the harm claim threshold. But it's a receiver problem, in as much as the receiver system deployment has to make sure that they can operate to whatever level the business decision maker thinks is appropriate, given that interference environment. Hey, okay, I, uh, let's go to Brian so we can get the, get the questions. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thanks. Sorry, I'm in a hotel lobby and a little, a little noisy. And Pierre, I've meant to not be so blunt with my, my chat box uh, comment. This meant to be a suggestion. <laughs> not a problem. Um, no, no, so, I appreciated that. <laughs> um, your, your chart earlier where you showed the harm claim threshold, the blue lines that said, you know, you can make a claim here. Mm. And you, you actually included in band and I, I, I was surprised I'm not really, yeah, exactly, this one. So the affected systems assignment, that's in band, which means it is out of band for the adjacent system, obviously, and presumably covered by the mass. So if you include that, aren't you asking the FCC to figure out exactly what the RF environment, I mean, the whole, I mean, to do that, they've already said what they can transmit. So now they got to understand aggregate interference and all sorts of stuff. Why not just leave yeah. the blue line empty in band? Great point, uh, Brian. Uh, short answer, yeah, you could. Uh, well, all I was trying to say there is that you don't have to. Uh, 
you and in fact you're absolutely right that that blue line is a way of saying what the out of band emissions uh, should be the difference of course is that this is what the receivers actually care about it's not the out of band emissions at the transmitter it's the out of band emissions that arrive at the receiver uh, but yeah you know you you may have you may have conflicts the other the other point that i just want to pick up on that you allow, you enable me to uh, respond to uh, is the fcc i as i understand it is making all these kinds of decisions already but often in the absence of the technical analysis but i speak under correction Okay, uh, Andy Scott uh, has a question, unless, uh, uh, Brian, you have a follow-up? Well, uh, only I think to maybe concur with what Pierre was saying is, it, presumably some degree of analysis was done in setting out-of-band masks anyway, because there's there's some presumption about what's going to happen in this um, in band for your neighbor but yeah, yeah but it. you know the, there's a number that comes up a lot is it 43 43 plus 10 log p it's minus 13 dbm <laughs> per megahertz typically yeah and that number comes up suspiciously often it's also redundant because it always comes up to minus 13 so i'm not sure yeah why say minus 13 but yeah but yeah your point is well taken uh, uh you know Andy, they the fcc it does consider these things. Yeah, I have a question here. Is it isn't this similar to receiver mask? Could you thanks, uh, Bauman? Could you define receiver mask for me? It would be very similar to this. I mean, the blue. But, line, what 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 do you mean by the word? I just don't. I just want to make sure I understand what you mean by the Essentially, just like mask. you have a transmission mask. This receiver mask would be inverse of that, which is what this is. Okay. It dep I think it depends. Uh, it depends on what you intend, how you intend the receiver mask to be used. Uh, if the receiver mask is part of a spec, uh, it's not. But if it's if it's just a receiver mask in, that says, look, this is the interference you need to cope with, you're absolutely right. And actually, I will sort of uh, sort of uh, validate what you've just said by show you an example I prepared earlier. I'm sorry about the skipping through. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, you know, here is a receiver mask. Uh, this is from an RTCA standard. You can read what it says over there. Um, to me, not being an not being familiar with the field, a few things are a little weird. It's like why an, a continuous wave interfering signal? What does that really mean? Uh, and it's measured at the antenna port. So, what assumptions are you making about the antennas? But you're absolutely right, Bob, and That is a mask. Yeah, I mean, I mean there are ways of you know inband uh, measurement of that. Uh, receiver performance, but I think the difference, the main difference that I see here is that you're essentially pushing the responsibility to towards the guy, who, <laughs> the owner of the receiver, the owner, the, the, the operator of that license, which is fine. Uh, and that's post uh, post deployment and or and versus, you know, actually requiring the receiver to meet that standard when it comes for certification. Which Correct. Is, it's an interesting uh, approach. Yeah, and uh, the reason I'm doing, I'm so glad you you said that. Uh, that's a that's an excellent point that I that I that I should under that I want to underline, which is, um, actually, I've asked a lawyer and I haven't got a straight answer yet. It's like when when you have harmful interference and you have protection against harmful interference, who is you? Who is protected against harmful interference? Is it uh, a user, a particular receiver, or is it the operator? Or is it the service? Uh, I would argue that the responsibility should be the operator of the system. And, the, and so I am absolutely pushing the responsibility to the operator of the system rather than, you know, the, the particular manufacturer of the receiver. They may, they may choose to uh, 
build a home plane threshold into the process of defining a receiver standard. Or oh, and, and and you know actually the, the, uh, to Manisha's chicken and egg point. I'm sorry, we're we're at time. One last thought. The the chicken and egg point is that the the distinction that I'm making. So if you think about that flowchart that I had earlier, you can simplify it. There's an RF environment. It influences the business and tech decisions that you make, which influences your your equipment design. And then the equipment get deployed and they change the RF environment. So it's a loop. So really what we're, in a way, it's not an either or decision. It's not either the RF equipment or it's the RF environment or the equipment. It's sort of both. I'm emphasizing the environment. Other people emphasize the equipment. And the reason why we're having this conversation is that the FCC could, can affect either or both. Yeah, and uh, let, let's get one more uh, raised hand in. We, we accidentally skipped over them. Andy, um, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, not not the slides, but the video, I believe, is what uh, JP says is okay to upload. Yeah. Uh, but Andy, I think you also had a question earlier. Um, well, very quickly, back on slide 19. And, slide 19. Uh, okay, let me just get back to slide 19 for you. And I'll be mercifully brief here. I, it, sorry, JP, I, it went past me on why that uh, middle red dot on the right uh, yeah, represented a situation where claim could uh, of uh, harmful interference couldn't uh, couldn't occur. Could you could you explain that to me one more time? I'll try. Um, uh, and I say I'll try because you know uh, my my statistics is really wonky. Um, but the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is when you take a measurement, uh, you know, and this is this is you know true for anything where you've got a bunch of data. Let's say you've got that cumulative distribution function. You have based the number that you say is your 95th percentile value, that red dot, on uh, a subset of all the possible measurements you could have taken in the world, right? You're just, you, you know, you're taking some data. So there, given that you are looking at a subset of all the possible measurements, there is an uncertainty, which is, uh, which is expressed as a confidence level. So typically what the confidence level says is, uh, if you were to take this measurement a uh, hundred times, 90 out of a hundred times, uh, it will be above that horizontal part of the brown line. So that's your, uh, the bottom end of your confidence level. Uh, you know, you can, again, actually, this is, you know, one of the decisions the FCC would have to take, you know, isn't, do you want to have the 90% confidence level or the 99% confidence level? If you want the 99% confidence level, you've got to take a lot more measurements. Uh, you know, 90% confidence level, uh, you know, you can get away with actually in our case for the 10 by 10 kilometers worth a few hundred measurements. A few okay, hundred. Right. Yep. Just falls outside your confidence uh, range. Then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we are over time. Thanks a bunch, uh, JP. And I'm going to uh, I'll upload the recording to the um, to the to the website, uh, and I'll I'll send out a link to that later. Um, and so we have scheduled for next week. Let me stop the recording. Uh, sorry. Um, stop recording.